in today's video. The tropical fire ant Solenopsis geminata is native to South and Central America and has spread to many other parts of the world, becoming serious pests. They build conspicuous mounds, which are aggressively defended by the painful stinging of often great numbers of workers. They have a high reproductive rate, a high population density, an effective dispersal behavior, and wide geographical distribution. These ants inhabit disturbed environments, often in areas of human habitat modification, and so, people are often forced to alter their outdoor activities where fire ants are present. Fire ants can sting repeatedly. Symptoms of a fire ant sting include burning and itching. The ant injects venom containing an oily alkaloid called solenopsin that is toxic to cells. It causes a white pustule to form in a day or two. Although the sting is not usually life-threatening, they are easily infected and may leave permanent scars. This nuisance will generally lower the tolerance of their presence among humans. So why would I or anybody want to keep tropical fire ants? Well, first of all, they are readily available, easy to start with and grow to very large numbers, making awesome and huge displays. The only real problem are containing them properly, maintenance and that awful sting. I have decided to try to keep a very large tropical fire ant colony. Some of you may not know yet, but this year the local science center is opening a biodiversity exhibition and I will be displaying some colonies there. And I thought that, it would, that having a giant fire ant colony in display would be incredible for everybody to see. From my last video about the tropical fire ant queens, I got some questions asking if they wouldn't kill each other and if they were or not monogenous. Well, I got some really interesting information to share with you and I hope you stick around because it's going to be worth it. As you may remember, they were initially all together and seemed to be doing fine, but unfortunately they were attacked by dust mites which ate all their eggs. So I had to remove all the queens, inspect one by one for any unwanted mites and then place them in a communal nest for 24 hours with a humid co cotton to attract any remaining mites. After 24 hours, I separated them into those smaller nests as I wanted to increase the chances of having a viable colony from all these queens. They have been separated into small AMAC nests, five nests with four queens each and one nest with five queens. And I also got one small colony with four queens already established and moving forward. So while I talk about the information I got, I will let the video roll to put you up to date visually on how our queens are doing. Just before I start, I would like to call your attention to the link in the description below to my website and where you will be able to read the full article I wrote for this video and where you will be able to access as well all the research papers for your own further reading if you wish so. First let's clarify what are the existing reproductive strategies classifications that occur in ant species. Ants employ two primary strategies in establishing new colonies, the Independent Colony Foundation ICF, and the Dependent Colony Foundation DCF. ICF is characterized by new queens dispersing alone and need to raise their first generation of offspring without the help of nestmate workers. Examples of ICF include solitary founding, claustral or semi-claustral, pleometrosis, the occurrence of several queens in a single nest, and social parasitism. DCF is characterized by existing established colonies being divided into different groups that will then become independent from each other. These new groups will have to disperse terrestrially. The queen or queens, normally ergotoid queens or gammergates, will be escorted by some of their nestmate workers to their new site location. They may or may not bring along some of the original nest brood. DCF includes a variety of dispersal methods, including fission and budding. Monogeny is the existence of only one egg-laying queen in a single colony, and polygeny is the coexistence of two or more egg-laying queens in a single colony. And finally, pleometrosis refers to the colony formation by multiple queens of the same species. A species can operate pleometrosis during foundation and yet be a monogenous species. This is for most cases related to ICF founding strategies following pleometrosis principles. And generally, once the first workers emerge, only one queen will remain, while the others are evicted or killed. Pleometrosis does not always equate to polygyny. The species of Solenopsis were considered to be monogenous until Banks and Glancy in 1973 observed polygyny in Solenopsis geminata and Solenopsis invicta, respectively. Banks, in the research paper Polygyny in the Colony of Fire Ant, Solenopsis geminata reads the following. Although the queens of some ant species have long been known to unite to found colonies, 
called pleometrosis. Only a few species have been observed to have multiple queens in a single well-established colony, polygyny. In March 1971, in Florida, while opening nests of field colonies of Solenopsis geminata and Solenopsis invicta for study, we noted two highly physiographic BLH females in a single well-established nest of Solenopsis geminata. The two queens and 50 worker ants from the nest were taken and returned to the laboratory for study. Each female was placed with 25 workers in a separate plexiglass ant nest. Egg production began in each nest within 72 hours after establishment. Small larvae were apparent after 10 days, pupae by 18 days, and the first workers by 27 days. Both colonies continued to grow and after 90 days, which was composed of several thousand workers. One queen died in one colony after 114 days, so the remaining workers were placed with the other colony and were accepted with little animosity. The results indicate that both the DL8 females were fertile and that the mature colonies of Solenopsis geminata may contain more than one functional queen. A few years later, in 1976, Adams wrote a research paper Polygyny in the Tropical Fire Ant, Solenopsis geminata, with notes on the imported fire ant, Solenopsis invicta. An incredible article and experiment reporting the observations of true polygyny in the tropical fire ants, Solenopsis geminata. And it reads the following. 31 queens of the tropical fire ant Solenopsis geminata were found in a single nest in the field. 14 of the 31 queens were established in individual nests with 25 workers each. Queens started to produce eggs within 24 to 48 hours. At day 7, each nest contained numerous larvae. At day 16, larvae were present in all 14 nests. At day 25, callow workers were present in all 14 nests. Dyes of seven colors were incorporated into the food of the ants of the 14 individual colonies, two colonies per color. The ants were permitted to feed freely for seven days. Individual colors appeared in the eggs laid by queens feeding on their respective dyes. All colonies were combined on the 17th day and the colors continued to appear in the eggs deposit in the new large colony for two days only, until Trophylactis blended the dyes to the point that they weren't indistinguishable, indicating a continued mutual contribution by each queen present in the composite colony. All laboratory colonies produced worker ants, indicating that all queens had been inseminated. The eggs, larvae and pupae produced by the 14 queens were, at a later stage, tended mutually in a common nest by all of the 14 queens and their combined workers, an example of true polygyny. In the research paper Colony Reproductive Structure in a Polygene Population of Solenopsis geminata by Vargo in 1993, he writes the following. Although the study reported considerable variability in fecundity among nestmate queens in polygene colonies of Solenopsis geminata, there was no strong indication that egg laying was dominated by an individual or group of individuals. Two years later, in 1995, a new observation was documented, something that would bring a completely new perspective to the previous findings. McKean's and Schenkel, in their research paper Queen Dimorphism and Reproductive Strategies in the Fire and Solenopsis Geminata, wrote the following. In this paper, we present out observations on a queen dimorphism in the fire ant Solenopsis geminata. We believe this to be the first record of a non-parasitic ant which founds colonies dependently and yet does not undergo colony fission nor budding, and the first record of microgeny in a monogene ant population. A late trapping studies of a monogene population of the fire ant Solenopsis geminata indicate that two sizes of genes are produced. Macrogenes, which participate in late spring and summer mating flights, are larger, fattier, and more than twice as heavy as microgenes, which participate in fall mating flights. In this graphic, you are able to see on the top part the captured queen sizes by season, and on the bottom, the mature colonies captured queen sizes, and as you can see, they are seriously overlapping. Continuing to read from the paper, behavioral evidence and rearing studies suggest that macrogenes found new colonies independently, whereas microgenes achieve colony queen status by infiltrating or being adopted by established colonies. In our opinion, Solenopsis geminata microgenes are unlikely to be successful unless they are adopted by orphaned colonies. This hypothesis best explains the results of our rearing studies and behavioral observations on Solenopsis geminata. Although our single trial with a newly mated microgene proved unsuccessful, orphan nests of Solenopsis geminata 
in both the laboratory and the field often accept replacement queens from other colonies. So how does polygyny and microgyny relate to each other? Well, Glancy and Lofgren in 1988 in their research paper Adoption of Newly Mated Queens a mechanism for proliferation and perpetuation of polygenous red imported fire ants, Solenopsis invicta, had reported a method by which polygenous colonies of Solenopsis invicta perpetuate themselves via the adoption of newly mated queens following their mating flight. This indicates that workers from polygenous colonies may accept alien queens, explaining some of the previous results, if we assume the same occurrence for Solenopsis geminata species. Unfortunately, I could not find any research paper that validates this theory in Solenopsis geminata. I would say it's not too far-fetched to assume it as true, since all Solenopsis geminata studies report so far very similar results as those done with Solenopsis invicta. So it's commonly assumed that monogenous colonies are doomed after the death of the queen. But evidence indicates that colony takeover and adoption of unrelated queens in polygenous colonies are not a rare phenomena but it might actually occur quite frequently in many ant species. Mortality rates of queens during solitary colony founding are usually high because of the limitation of suitable nest sites, adverse climatic condition or predation. But by successfully being adopted into an established colony or taking over an orphaned one, the young queen has considerably increased her chances to reproduce. In Heinz and Keller research paper, Alternative Reproductive Strategies, a queen perspective in ants, it can be read the following. The replacement of old queens by young and related queens in both polygenous and monogenous species raises important questions for social insect researchers. How frequently do colonies recruit related versus unrelated queens? Are unrelated queens frequently able to enter and displace the breeding queen in monogenous colonies? So. How do these queens circumvent the mechanisms of recognition that generally allow workers to effectively exclude non-nestmates? And finally, concluding the article, the finding that the breeding structure of ant colonies is more easily altered than it had been thought previously calls for an integration of both life history and kin selection perspectives in the study of social evolution and kin conflict. So I hope you have enjoyed this combined article. And uh, how does this actually translate into my ant keeping experiences? Uh, well, right now, based on the present information, I assume that I have captured microgene colony queens based on the time of year I captured them, but unfortunately I cannot take any measurements, so it's just an assumption. Another reason why I think it's best to continue to keep them together and feed them, if it turns out to be true, then they wouldn't probably be able to found the colonies themselves separately. So let's see how all of this will turn out in the end. And I bet that you are all thinking, wouldn't it be totally awesome to test this theory with the Fire Nation when it got orphaned? How cool would that be? And if you paid attention to the, to the video, you might be wondering what were those white spots moving around? Well, you guessed right, they were mites. And uh, I actually, uh, after the recording, uh, I went and picked them out one by one. Actually, it was good that I did this video because uh, without the micro lens, I wouldn't have been able to spot them. So yeah, now all the colonies are clean and I will keep you posted on their developments in a few weeks time. Well guys, that's all for me. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have enjoyed and see you on the next video. Cheers.